Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I'd like to talk about our new way of voting, and I couldn't have a guest more qualified to discuss it with than Doug Kellner, New York's outspoken advocate for election reform and co-chair of the State Board of Elections. Welcome. Hello, Ronnie. And thank you for all your relentless efforts to make voting easier, accessible, honest, and everything else you can do for us. Well, thank you, but there's still so much more that we need to do. I know. It's endless, isn't it? Tell us, why are we voting a different way? Well, in uh, 2002, Congress passed the Help America Vote Act, which uh, was a response to the 2000 Florida election, uh, which uh, was intended to bring new voting technology uh, throughout the country. And uh, one of the provisions of the Help America Vote Act says that uh, <laughs> every voter, um, including uh, uh, visually impaired voters, has to be able to use the system without assistance. And no one could figure out a way to make our lever voting machines uh, fully accessible to visually impaired voters. So uh, New York, uh, like uh, the other 25 states or so that uh, used lever voting machines, uh, uh, was required to replace the lever voting what machines. What happened to them? Where are all those wonderful well, they're, machines? They're, they're sitting in warehouses today, <laughs> but it won't be long before uh, the counties have to dispose of them. Do they and, get sold uh, overseas or anything? Actually, what New Jersey did is they uh, tied them together and used them as fishing reefs in the Atlantic. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a new way of voting. That's right. And, uh, and it's pretty simple uh, that voters should not be intimidated. Yeah. They start out the same way they did. They go in and sign the registration the book. book. The same old book. <laughs> but the next step is that the uh, uh, poll inspector will give the voter a paper ballot. The voter will go to a privacy booth to fill out the paper ballot. They can take as much time as they want in uh, marking their paper ballot. And then <laughs> after they've marked the paper ballot, the voter brings it to a scanning machine, and the voter puts the ballot into the scanning machine. Uh -huh. <laughs> and for voters who want assistance in marking their ballots, there are ballot marking devices. And um, they're not being used as much as they should be. So uh, for example, in the primary, there were complaints that, uh, oh, the print is too small. And yes, I need my glasses, too, to read the ballot. But uh, the ballot marking devices, uh, uh, have large uh, screens and uh, can uh, help the voter fill out the ballot so that they don't have to... Uh, but if you're blind, read. how do you do it? At the ballot marking device, the ballot marking device will actually yeah. read the ballot to the voter. And um, How does it do that? Um, the voter puts on headphones oh, and uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, keys that uh, the voter uses in order to mark the ballot. And the ballot marking devices also have what are called sip and puff devices. So people who don't have use of their hands can um, uh, do it by uh, blowing through a straw or sipping or, or sucking on a straw, um, which is amazing for people who are used to it. They can do it quite quickly. Yeah. And there are also foot paddles that will uh, operate the ballot marking device. So when you sign in, you tell people that you need that assistance? Yes. Because there is a, a sort of a magnifying sheet or something, isn't there, that's there? Well, there that's is, but that's good. not very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yes, if you have yeah. trouble reading the ballot, you should ask to use the ballot marking device. That's very interesting. So now you have, you've not only marked your ballot, but you've put it through a machine that also tallies it. That's right. So the, the machine, uh, when you put it in the machine, uh, if there's no problems with the ballot, it will say, thank you for voting and you know that uh, your vote has gone into the machine and has been counted. And your original ballot is also uh, maintained in a ballot box so that uh, uh, New York has a very strict auditing rules that 3% of all of the machines uh, are, have the ballots hand counted uh, to make sure that the uh, tally matches the machine and uh, um, our experience so far in the two years that uh, we've been using the machines uh, have been that there are uh, very few discrepancies. But if there were discrepancies, then it would escalate, and there's always the possibility of hand counting all of the ballots 
in order to make sure that there was. Uh, so when you say three percent, is it three percent statewide? That's right. Three okay. percent in each county. In each county, that's very interesting. So now, if you have a recount. Is there a mandatory recount? New York has a, a, a mandatory recanvas, which really uh, involves uh, uh, recounting the tapes of the machines. Uh, but if there were a discrepancy or allegations of fraud, there's always the possibility of a full hand count uh, using the original ballots. So did the system work? Uh, in general, yes. And uh, what we've found is that uh, training is the key. So in those counties that uh, did the pilot project last year, um, uh, uh, you know, they had uh, some uh, typical startup problems or inspector confusion. Uh, but we found that there were many fewer problems in those counties. Now, New York City did it the first time in the primary election. And so... Uh, there was a uh, break-in period, and hopefully um, the uh, ability of the inspectors will advance so, so that... Uh, you think uh, a lot of it comes response. down to the training of the inspectors. There's no question that that's the most important And we thing. still have two Democrats, two Republicans at each polling place. At each uh, election, election district. Election district. And sometimes yeah. there are many election right. districts in a poll site. And the state has no jurisdiction over that part of our process. Is uh, that the, right? The, the election is run by the New York City Board of Elections. And the state simply makes the rules and uh, has general supervisory responsibilities. But the elections are run by the counties. And that's the hard part, is actually running. So we're, all, we're in New York City dependent on our board. Board of Elections. That's right. And how does that Board of Elections get set up? Well, there's one Democratic and one Republican commissioner in each borough, and they are named by the party organization, by the Democratic and Republican parties, so, and confirmed by the city council. By the members of the party and the city council That's in right. each borough. So they're accountable, basically. It's To the parties. To the parties. And the party's accountable, supposedly, to its voters. That's right. But increasingly, we don't have that, that you know, the other side, I mean, making them work at the very best. I mean, when I was younger, when you were in your right. height of, of local politics, they were very active groups of voters and districts that really made demands on the party structure. I don't think that's happening that much, is it? I think that's right, but I think that... Uh that the level of activity within the party organizations has been declining. And of course, the core are the political clubs that, that make up the right. grassroots membership of the party who are active. And um, where the political clubs have been declining, you also see it more difficult to run the elections because it's more difficult to recruit inspectors mm -hmm and to hold inspectors accountable. Right. You have 30,000 people it takes in New York City to run the elections, who serve as poll workers on election day. And so recruiting those 30,000 people and training them is a major task for the Board of and Elections. And it's, it, it's difficult because most, very frequently, these are people who are not the sharpest people in the world. So I would assume if you've changed the system, they really need to be trained a lot. That's right. And, and it's really, I mean, I've always felt, we've discussed this before, of how do, you, how do you train, how do you recruit people to volunteer? Because it's really a civic duty, although you do get paid. And I think historically, paying was the incentive to recruiting, right? I mean, in the old days... Well, public service, clubs. you had more people with leisure time who were willing to do it True. as a public service. Right. But then they've also extended the poll hours, so it's a long day. You start yeah. work at 5.30 in the morning, right. and you don't finish until 9.30 or so in the evening. So that's a 16-hour day. And um, that's hard as you get older. So why <laughs> don't we break it up into two eight-hour shifts? Well, Why don't we make it a, res a civic responsibility like we do for jury duty or something like that? Or why don't we recruit whole new areas? I mean, you said that the state changed the law to make high school seniors eligible to be inspectors. That's right. Well, they had two, two innovations this year that Senator Adabo, who's the chair of the Senate Elections Committee, and um, Assemblywoman Joan Millman, who's the chair of the Assembly Elections Committee, uh, uh, put in place this year. One is uh, they allow high school seniors now to be inspectors. And uh, the second is they do uh, provide for split shifts. Now, of course, 
On the split shift side, the city board says, well, that just would mean we'd have to recruit twice as many people. Instead of 30,000, we'd have to recruit 60,000 people. Um, I think the theory was maybe it'd be easier if uh, to recruit people for an eight-hour eight day hours. instead of a 16-hour day. Well, you have so day. many people, though, that are looking. But, you know, we have students, I mean, in high school who need to work or who want extra money, who also are interested in the electoral process. College students, the whole city university system, I mean, why aren't they should recruit from there? So I guess we should make demands of the local board of elections. Go out and find and train right. people better. And to be fair to the local board, they need the resources right. also. So for Manhattan, which has uh, 6,000 poll workers, you have six people at the board of elections who are in charge of recruiting them uh, and training them. Does the money and that they get paid come from the money in the budget? That's right, city taxes. So that has been cut considerably. Well, the, the, the amount that the poll workers get paid has uh, not gone up uh, for uh, at least 10 years They were now. looking they for an increase. They get $200 a day. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, many have been calling to increase that, that $200 for a 16-hour day is not realistic. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, the Board of Elections, like so many other city agencies, has really uh, been left uh, without being able to uh, get the resources to do everything that it wants to so do. So how large a staff do they have, do you know? Um, it's uh, about 340 people so a percentage, full time. So the percentage that goes to salaries of the workers at the board is a percentage of their total thing, and then the, the, the salaries that go to the inspectors, is an, how do they compare those two percentages? Well, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, there are, they are separate budget lines, oh, but, yeah. the, uh, but the uh, poll worker payments are um, roughly a third of the I total understand. budget. Is the, um, I, I'm sorry that I don't know this, I should. The city, the Charter Commission, is there a thing on for nonpartisan elections this year? No. Do you feel uh, that the weakened party structure, which I, mean, I think in my lifetime it's not like it used to be, that all of that contributes to the, the way we vote, the, the, the turnout, everything, and that the partisanship is important or not important? Well, I, th I think that the partisanship is a valuable thing, and this anti-partisan trend that we've seen in the last uh, 20 or 30 years has uh, really hurt our ability mm. to have representative government because the the political parties and having and and what what's most important to the political parties to me are strong local political clubs with people who join them and do it for um, civic interest instead right. of self-interest right. and and you don't have that level of involvement anymore the people who are watching their elected officials, and who can do something about it. If you're in a political club and your elected official is uh, straying, then you, you can organize and run against that. Yeah, or threaten that you're not going right. to support them. Right. And, and and with the breakdown in the clubs, when you don't have uh, organized, local, powerful clubs uh, in a position to do that, then uh, it's that much harder to hold elected officials but the accountable. the overall movement partly was, as a result, it's a, a disenchantment with the parties. I mean, and who they nominate and how it goes. So you saw, I think in presidential elections, we were talking about Howard Dean and his beat-ups, and he formed, they formed groups outside of the party in the primary, sort right. of, or it was in the party, but they weren't club people. Right, but that's not going to reform the process exactly. then. And, and, and the Obama pe it was a whole separate structure because the party didn't endorse or people didn't endorse him. So it, it works against it. It's too bad that that's happening. And part of it must be also the money that gets fed into campaigns. I agree with you. Yeah. And campaign finance is a very important issue. Um, and now. what is the state doing about it? Well, um, uh, right now we're under attack, really. Um, they, they, just, just, the state finance is not the same as the city campaign finance. Well, the, the, I mean, New separate. York City has a very laudable program where it uh, uh, provides funding for mm -hmm. candidates who run for city council, borough president, and for the citywide offices, mayor and uh, controller and uh, public advocate. 
uh, uh, those are the only public campaign financing in New York State. But uh, uh, the State Board of Elections is responsible for the campaign finance disclosure system, where everybody who's running for office has to disclose their contributions, and they file, and we put it up on the internet so that anybody can download it. And uh, uh, for us, keeping that disclosure system working is very important. And of course, funding is important. And uh, again, there's the issue of, uh, uh, of getting the legislature uh, and the governor to uh, appropriate sufficient funds to run that system. And right now, it's really being run on chewing gum and spit, um, but, but we are able to keep the computers up. Um, enforcement, there really isn't a whole lot of money in the budget for enforcement, and we'd like to do more enforcement. Right now, the main enforcement is against people who don't file at all. Mm. Um, and then uh, there's a huge um, uh, amount of litigation occurring of people challenging the whole disclosure system in New York based on the new Supreme, Supreme Court. Court decision in the Citizens United case. And right now I'm spending a very substantial amount of my time working to defend uh, in court New York's disclosure system from uh, those who are challenging it and arguing that there should be no disclosure system at all. That's really dangerous, isn't it? Uh, in my view, yes. And there's no limit on contributions to candidates, is there? Or is yes, that... there, there are limits on contributions. Uh, basically, it's uh, uh, five and, cents a voter. And that's why the disclosure also is very important. That's right. To try to keep it even. Um, what about all these other groups that are, are they buying ads in New York State? And you have no jurisdiction then over them. The political ads that have no sponsor. <laughs> well, we're, we're arguing that we do have jurisdiction, uh -huh. and it is our intention to argue in court that, uh, that the New York disclosure rules should still apply, and uh, notwithstanding the Citizens United decision. One of the things that the U.S. Supreme Court mm -hmm. said that there were no limits on contribution, no limits on expenditures that are not coordinated with a candidate. So if a group like the Chamber of Commerce wants to spend money uh, educating the electorate, uh, they can do that as long as they don't coordinate with a candidate. But the U.S. Supreme Court decision didn't say that they wouldn't have to disclose who's spending the money. And New York is still taking the position that we have to make those disclosures and that uh, uh, the federal law did not exempt groups from making disclosures, even if they're not coordinating with candidates. Is there a similar case like that federally? Yes. There are, there are, um, interestingly enough, the first case in New York was brought by the teachers' union to challenge it. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, voter education fund of uh, the New York State Union of Teachers. Why would and they object to disclosing who contributed well, to their fund? They didn't want to have to file because they felt that the that there were too many uh, uh, problems with with filing, and they didn't want to have to disclose who they were supporting or backing. And they lost that case. We we um, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, the state board opposed that, and the federal judge uh, denied a preliminary injunction. Although the case is still pending, so it, so it's not completely over. And then the National Organization for Marriage, um, which has been bringing cases like this throughout the country, has filed a case in the federal court in Buffalo, which will be heard next week, uh, making a, a similar challenge, arguing that uh, they should not have to um, make any disclosures on who their donors are. Now, does the Attorney General's office in the state also work with you on this? Uh, the Attorney General's office did a great job on the NYSUIT case, but now, since the Attorney General is running for governor <laughs> and the National Organization for Marriage says that they want to run attack ads uh, they, on, they on the themselves. Democratic <laughs> candidate for governor, the Attorney General thought he should recuse himself. So uh, we're now working with... Uh, but you work with the federal people also? Do you coordinate efforts? No? No, not really. Not really. Uh, the, the state board is uh, more or less on its own now in defending these lawsuits. But we're putting a tremendous effort and uh, concentrating our resources right now on defending those cases.
That's terrible that the teachers decided to sue. I really must say, <laughs> they're supposed to be teachers. I always feel that one of the reasons we're in this political situation we are is that they're not teaching civics anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now they're also going to help destroy the system. Um, we, we were talking about the history of, of, uh, of voting, and it was such an interesting history. When did we first start having elections? Well, you know, in colonial eras, yeah. uh, all elections were in person at meetings. Uh, uh, you would have your town meeting, and uh, many of us in school learned about the old New England town government. Well, that's how New York also ran its towns, that uh, uh, everybody met and they would vote on the budget and vote on what they, what they wanted to do. And at those meetings, they would also elect their representatives. And that was done usually by voice, um, that it would be unanimous. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, uh, although there were a couple of contested elections yeah. in, uh, in colonial times, then after the American Revolution, uh, especially when you're voting statewide for governor, uh, it became very difficult to, uh, um, <laughs> to do it by voice. Um, uh, and uh, I could go into all the yeah. different reasons, but they started using written ballots, and then they would count the ballots and, uh, and send uh, the returns uh, off to the state. And so we started voting by ballots in New York uh, around 1800. Um, but even then, it's not like we know ballots today. You were responsible for your own ballot. The government didn't print ballots. So you um, came to vote and you put your own piece of paper. Right. And so that started local organizations passing out tickets that they would interview candidates and, and propose candidates and pass out tickets to the voters as they would go into the uh, um, poll site. And that and, ticket was their vote, and that, was their ballot. And they would just take the ticket they wanted and put that in the ballot box. And um, uh, so Tammany Hall was a fraternal organization, a lodge, and, uh, and Tammany would uh, endorse candidates and print out its ticket. Its tickets were always green, by, <laughs> by the way. But, uh, and so everybody else... So <laughs> and they eventually affiliated with the Democratic Party. Similar organizations around the state would get together and they would hold a convention to nominate their candidate for governor. And, uh, and that's how the political parties formed, was these local organizations that would pass out tickets. And the ticket system was replaced by government printed ballots in 1890. So that's how long that system it, went. Yeah. And when did we get our machines? Well, <laughs> New York City didn't go to voting machines until 1922 for general elections and 1956 for I remember elections. poll watching when we had paper <laughs> ballots because we were in a, a, in a real battle on the west side, mm -hmm. as usual, and I remember sitting on top of the ballot box until the, the police took it away because we were, it was wild. So, <laughs> so I was a big fan of the lever machines, and I, I believed that we could continue using yeah. these lever machines forever. But uh, higher authorities have <laughs> spoken, and um, so now we're um, using paper ballots that are scanned. And I would say that um, New York has really been on the cutting edge. We have really the um, uh, premier scanning equipment on the market with uh, uh, very substantial uh, voting integrity safeguards built in. So, for example, the machines have no access uh, to the Internet or um, uh, the... Um, um, uh, and there are a number of other technical it security issues. It took years, issues. didn't it, to find the machines That's right. that were going to be... That's right. And we had the most thorough certification process of any jurisdiction anywhere in the world has done in terms of uh, testing the machines uh, to make sure that they do exactly... So who did land up making our machines? So we, ha we have two vendors in New York State. New York City uses uh, uh, election <laughs> systems, uh, ES&S, the... Uh, uh, and, uh, and who's ES and S? Election si software, election systems and software. It's a uh, Nebraska-based company, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, now I'm right. blocking the name of the senator who is oh. uh, <laughs> a former Republican former. senator. Uh, um, oh, I, is the yeah. Uh, All uh, right, well, is the founder of the company, but. Uh, uh, but as I say, the, uh, um, the 
Another important feature of these machines is that not only do they retain the original paper ballots, but the machines also copy the images of the ballots and store the images of the ballots. And um, so you have a way of tracing back how each ballot was actually counted by the machine. And that's a, a, an important safeguard that uh, many jurisdictions that use ballot scanning don't have. Um, uh, that makes it that much harder in order to uh, introduce a, uh, a malicious code in terms of uh, affecting the count on the machines. So just one final thing to our voters is that you fill in the little circle, right? That's right. All right. <laughs> and it's very clear on the ballot. So New York voters should know that they are in the historic process of voting. I mean, if you were going to mark the different highlights in that whole process from after the Revolutionary War, this is one of the defining, they say defining moments or something. That's right. So they should certainly make use of it and go and vote. That's the important thing. And you think that we're going to be able to do it, but we should pay attention to our local boards to see that they are prepared for it. That's right. Yeah. And, and uh, I know that the people at the city board are working very hard to get the message out, to train the inspectors. I think the most important things for the inspectors are getting used to giving voter privacy, mm -hmm. yeah. letting them mark their ballots in private. And, and not take the ballot away and put it in the machine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so hold on to it and put it in yourself. We've come to the end of our half hour. So, Doug, again, uh, it's so great to have you involved. I just wish you could run all of the elections all over the state. Uh, but thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ronnie. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.